everyone. My name is Shivani Ramlucham, and you're joining us on the NGC Focus Litfest Facebook page for a very special panel. It's called How We Remember, and we're reflecting on the 175th anniversary of Indian arrival in Trinidad and Tobago. We wanted to discuss this in just the right number of ways. In an ideal world, not afflicted by a global health pandemic, we'd be doing this in an intimate setting, probably in the old fire station, probably at the Writer Center. Since we can't, we've done something that I think is very close to the next best thing, if not better. We've gathered some really special voices. And along with my colleague, Nicholas Lachlan, we'll introduce them to you and then get this panel started. Nicholas. Okay, thanks to Giovanni and welcome everyone. Um, normally I would introduce in alphabetical order, but since we're, we're stacked on the screen, um, maybe I'll just do it in the order in which you'll, you'll see everyone. So next to me is Gayatra Bahadur. Gayatra was born in Guyana, uh, but moved to the US when she was a small child and she's been based there ever since. She, is, she worked for many years as a journalist and her book, Coolie Woman, uh, which was published about six years ago, um, is a really fascinating historical study that draws together her family history with the history of, of Indian indentureship in Guyana in particular. Um, an extraordinary and groundbreaking book, uh, which was, among other things, shortlisted for the, the George Orwell Prize in the UK. Um, below Gayatra is Jeremy Pointing uh, of People Tree Press in the UK, um, which was, uh, remind me, Jeremy, is it your 35th? fifth anniversary this year? It is indeed, yeah. Yeah, so People Tree Press, founded 35 years ago, uh, based in Leeds, and which has become the leading publisher of Caribbean writing in the world, um, just by the sheer number of writers and the sheer number of books it's published. Um, below Jeremy is Andre Bagu. Andre is a, a poet, an essayist, a journalist, um, he's published several books of poems, but his latest book, which is going to appear in a few months' time, uh, called The Undiscovered Country, is a, is a book of, of essays of critical writing that weaves together uh, sort of a personal history with, uh, with art, with literature, with politics. And next to Andre is Gabriel Hussain. Gabriel is a writer, an academic, an activist, She's, uh, she teaches at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus, and she's currently the head of the Institute for, um, always get it wrong, Gabrielle, it's the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, right, in that order. Um, Gabrielle is also um, one of the contributors to this anthology, We Mark Your Memory, uh, which was an anthology published last year. It originated with the Commonwealth Writers Program and the Commonwealth Foundation, and it's met, it was uh, an anthology of writing from literally from around the world that marks the uh, 100th anniversary of the abolition of, of Indian indenture around the world. So it includes contributors from, from Trinidad, from Guyana, uh, but also from far-flung places such as South Africa, Mauritius, Fiji, literally from every, almost every country in the world that was part of that uh, system of global imperial indentureship. Um, and we've borrowed something from the title of the book, uh, We Mark Your Memory, to give us a theme for this conversation this afternoon, where we're going to reflect on how we remember things. Um, Gabrielle has a, a poem in the book, and we're going to start by having her read it, and then have a bit of conversation uh, about that. And then uh, each, of our, each of the writers will read pieces of their work, and we'll have a general conversation that tries to weave together the many, many ideas that come under this big heading of, of how we remember how we remember Indian arrival in particular, but also how we remember our, our collective history more generally. So, Gabrielle. Greetings, everyone. Um, thanks so much for including me. Uh, so this piece is called Chutney Love. Really, you're supposed to be standing up and moving to it, but we'll take it sitting down. Mm -hmm. Them call me Chutney Love. And if you see my belly roll, 
Man can't stop me on a stage when they chuck me take control. I ain't nobody bougie, no promise to lie him, but when the tassa start to roll up beta, them lyrics you have, I done write myself in. I could speak a little Hindi from a nanny and Indian movie, and just lick up my curry and roti, and well, my house to see both Eid and Diwali. But this chutney, I just feel it, curving in all my wrist and ankle bone, 150 years we woman singing it, and not in Matico alone. Now, I never yet did leave Trinidad since India was left on the boat, so I know that this chutney is real Trini make national culture, like Calypso. We did sing it, we did dance it, from back all them years come true. You feel we was quiet and obedient, and this whining thing is new. When them young village girls was at a wedding, my nanny could have showed them a thing or two. Now, some of them don't like this chutney, say how we just get on too wild, but it's the freedom and we spirit that give chutney its pride and style, and look how now we everywhere. Soka show, radio, paran, and carnival. Sita, Tabla, Hindi, and Indian history claiming a place in Trini Bacchanal. Now, I don't have much learning, no big, big book, no fancy word, but I know that it is in we music that the lesson can be heard. Now, some of them do like this chutney, say how, you know, we just get on too wild. But it's the freedom I want to remind you, the freedom that we must remember that gives chutney its pride and style. And just one last, last thing before I go about how Indians and Africans like to, you know, use each other so. It's one set of noise for a little political power, but we both cross water for the empire. And ever since we land up here together, it's only with one history that we grow. And now I'm watching all kind of people Feel we music for so, and everybody come to see that we was one people from since long ago. So when I tell you, I love the chutney for how much we have achieved. As Jahaji Bai, when I hear them say we coming together, just don't forget me Jahaji Bai hen if you please. And girl, always play up yourself for real. That's it. Thank you so much for that, Gabrielle. And as I reflect on that incredibly moving poem, it occurs to me, I'd love to ask you about how the very vast concept of Indo-Caribbean feminisms are at work not just in the poem, but in all of your labor of scholarship and of creative expression. We've just been talking about how titanic a concept this is, how much there is to unpack in it. How do you live with the reality of Indo-Caribbean feminism in your own life and your work? Thanks so much for that question. Uh, just to say about this poem, you know, it was written in 1995. The United National Congress had come to power. People had thought it was quote-unquote Indian time now. But there were these excellent streams of um, community and solidarity, Brother Marvin's, Jahaji Bai, Brother of the Boat, and so on, you know, we were still getting the idea of um, Drupati and her music and the women's ability to cross the Indo-Trinidadian sphere into the public sphere and the right of Indian women to do so. And so there were all of these kinds of ethnic, gender, sexual boundary markings and crossings that were happening. And so I was doing rap, so I was in the rap, so movement at the time. And that's why the poem is almost as if you're talking because rap, so is about the power of the word and the rhythm of the word. And so it empowers a tradition of Trinidadian language as if it's poetry itself. And that's what spoken word is in Trinidad. And so to use the Trinidadian language and to introduce uh, Indian words, um, into Rapso, again, as a boundary crossing and as a space for saying, you know, whatever the histories are, remember women's histories, remember women's solidarities, remember women's rights and struggles and so on. And so I think that sets the frame for Indo-Caribbean feminisms, that the idea is that uh, since we've all landed up here, the fact is it is with one history that we grew 
The fact is that there have been boundary markings, boundary work that has kept us divided, that has kept women in particular in having to play certain roles, negotiate with particular stereotypes. But that the ultimate struggle that I think of when I think of our arrival, but also of the legacy of Indo-Caribbean feminism is of Indian women seeking to be in control of their bodies, their community, their pleasure, um, their belonging in ways that they imperfectly work through to be always remembered and not forgotten and, um, and to do that as part of, um, of creating what being from the Caribbean means. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I think perhaps now we can ask Gayatra to read a bit from, from Cooley Woman. And it seems like a good segue because you were just talking, um, Gabrielle, about um, that whole question of, you know, Indian women and control of their own bodies and their, their, their presence and their futures. And that's very much kind of woven into the fabric of Cooley Woman. So perhaps Gayatra, for anyone who may not have read the book, tell us a bit about the background to it and what it does. And then we'd love to hear a bit from it before we, we talk to you. Thanks, Nicholas. And Gabby, that was amazing. I, of course, read the poem in the anthology, We Mark Your Memory, but it's another thing to hear it spoken and performed, which is its, its right place. Yeah. Um, so Cooley Woman is, um, it's, I describe it as a personal history of indenture because it, it jumps off um, as a story of my own search for identity, I guess. I mean, we're talking about arrival and it's, it's difficult for, um, I mean, I sort of have to acknowledge that for me, the personal ar ar arrival that was most immediate was my family's arrival in the United States um, in the early 1980s uh, in New Jersey, um, which was at that time, a hostile place in Jersey City for people who looked like us. And, um, you know, there was a racist gang in our neighborhood when I was a child. Um, and so there were many questions about identity um, that were really shaped by that arrival into, into the United States. And that led me on a journey um, uh, into the stories, into archives, into memory to sort of figure out who I am. Um, and um, it's about my great grandmother, Sujaria, who is the closest, our closest link to India. And I'd always been uh, intrigued by her story because she, um, she left India four months pregnant and she didn't have a husband uh, accompanying her. So um, I did not expect that it would become a story as much about gender as it was. Uh, but she was um, she was the figure guiding me into this past and into this exploration of identity. Um, and of course, I was limited in my ability to find out uh, very much about her, um, but I was able to use the archives to to sort of um, broaden the history and and to make it. Um, a history of, of women in indenture. To use the archives and to also use the groundbreaking scholarship of uh, people like Pat Muhammad and Vereen Shepherd, um, you know, who were your mentors, Gabby, and whose work you and others, like Lisa Autar, have carried forward. Um, so that is what the book is about. It begins in New Jersey, goes to Guyana and, um, and India, and even a bit to Trinidad. Um, so I will read, I'll read a, a section that is set on the seas. Uh, it's, it's, it's about crossing the Kalapani and it's based on um, my close examination of roughly a hundred ship records. Um, and uh, it's my favorite section of the book to read. So. Whenever a ship docked, the chief immigration agent at its destination had to report on its passage from India. Some of these dispatches, including the one detailing my great-grandmother's voyage, 
have been destroyed. Those that survive pull back the screen, if only for brief moments and partial views, on the lives of the women aboard. It's hard in these glimpses to escape the angle of sexual exploitation by figures of all ranks and races. In these archives of misconduct, the women appear resisting advances or giving in to them, or in the eyes of many ship officials, courting them. But the records also provide other views of the women on deathbeds, giving birth, losing children, going mad, being driven to suicide, engaged in infanticide, rejecting or being rejected by shipboard husbands, demanding that husbands prove themselves, stowing away, crying, cursing, possibly in love and clearly in anguish. I cannot imagine that the journey was anything but a saga, even for emigrants whose lives passed relatively without incident. Seasickness afflicted most. A majority fell ill with mumps, measles, dysentery, hookworm, or fever. The ache for home was so sharp that one ship surgeon declared, I know that many die from nostalgia pure and simple. The excitement of the newness of everything keeps them, keeps them up for a time, but soon dies away and is followed by depression when they realize what they have done. The realization must have dawned slowly as the sea lengthened and the conditions aboard affected them one by one, as blankets rough as jute, sometimes rotten and foul smelling, caused pus to form on children, as the fans for circulating air were shut down at night when most needed, as the condenser to make the water potable broke, which it routinely did, and as the floor beneath them sweated. All the while, surgeons prepared their balance sheets of births and deaths, recording Shiva's unending dance without realizing it. The Hindu god who destroys in order to create, who dances in a ring of flames to maintain the universe's ceaseless cycle of creation and destruction, did not forget the cargo hold. I'm referring to something far more metaphysical than mortality or birth rates. Here a woman born on a ship to the West Indies in 1888. On that mad ocean when all was tossing, people's heads were spinning, and then labor pains started for Ma to have her child. On that mad ocean I was born. On that mad ocean I came to life. She was describing her own origins, but with her incantatory words, she could have been telling the creation story of our people, mine and hers. She could have continued in her voice of myth. In our beginning, there was a boat. On that mad ocean, we came to life. We passed the Red Sea to reach the black. The water was blue before it was green, and then it was mud. We crossed seven seas, seven shades of water, shades of darkness and light. Light that died and darkness that was born. Darkness somehow extinguished and light rekindled. The captain's wheel became Shiva's fiery circle, turning and turning in its cosmic spiral. And in the gyrating of the gales and the churning of the waves, as one steered and the other danced, we became new. The moorings of caste had loosened, and people who had left behind uncles, sisters, husbands, and mothers substituted shipmates, their jihajis, for kin. Unravel, they began ever so slowly to spin the threads of a novel identity. Indenture ships were not slave ships, but there can be no denying a few ties that should have bound the three million Africans trafficked by the British as slaves and the million Indians transported as coolies. The people in the hold in both cases were cut from the same demographic, mainly young and overwhelmingly male. Women were in short supply and subject to sexual exploitation during both crossings. And both journeys were transformative signaling a break with the past, making whatever came before it seem almost as unimaginable to later generations as time and space before the Big Bang. In the beginning, there was a boat. Having emerged from its belly as survivors, the indentured Indians could no longer be who they had been. Like the slaves before them, they were an entirely new people, forged by suffering, created through destruction. In this sense, above all else, theirs was a middle passage, marked by brutal reinvention. 
How do I even begin to situate my great grandmother in this odyssey? If I draw an imaginary line from moment to moment on the ships, from glimpse to glimpse of women aboard, will her shape emerge, constellation-like? Could the wrong shape emerge if I connect the wrong moments to each other? How do I know which are right? Will her constellation give off light? Thanks, Gayatra. Um, I'm struck by, you know, one of the last sentences you read there, you ask, you know, how do you imagine your, your great grandmother's life? Um, I mean, one of the things that's fascinating about the book is that it combines, as you say, archival research with a kind of um, journalistic work, going and field work, asking people questions, finding people. But it also, with literary technique, but also with, with techniques of the imagination, precisely because there were simply things you could not find. And the only way to write about them was to, to imagine them. So um, that question of when remembering turns into imagining or vice versa. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, about what you had to grapple with in writing this book and what do you think other writers in, in exploring similar histories, have, how they've managed to, to deal with that place where memory and imagination have to collide to, to come at some kind of truth. Mm. So, you know, several people have referred to Kui Woman as a novel, and I never know quite what to make of that, partly because, you know, I'm a journalist and honor bound to the facts as, as I can apprehend them. Um, and I think the reason they misname the genre is because there are a few places where, um, a very few places where I do slip into these acts of the imagination uh, because I, I had to. And this was really set by um, my limitations and the limitations of, of the archive. So for instance, um, there is, I think the most radical moment in the book is when I, um, I read my great grandmother, I imagine her sitting um, at what it, one of these kathas or storytelling sessions late at night on Plantation Enmore in Guyana. And I imagine that at, at this um, katha, they're, they're telling the story of the Ramayan. And then I place myself in her head and try to imagine how she would have, what she would have made of this tale of, of, of women's honor, right, and exile, what she would have made of it there in that setting on the plantation in the Guyana, in Guyana, um, where um, so many notions of women's honor were being disturbed just um, in daily transactions, transactions of survival on the plantation. Um, so, I mean, your question is about how writers uh, can navigate those um, sort of gaps and silences in, in, in the archive. Um, I think um, with as much audacity as you can muster for your own self. And for me, I have to admit that it was hard, especially seven years ago, and it did come out, God, seven years ago. Right. I mean, I saw myself primarily as a reporter. Right. So, you know, there, I could only I can't possibly imagine. Right. Invent, speculate, because they would have to take back my 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 press card <laughs> at that point. But, you know, with as much audacity as you can muster, given that um, this is our own history. Right. Uh, so that gives us a certain permission. And there are all sorts of resources that we can draw on that we didn't even realize that we could. Um, you know, things in the body, song, stories that are passed on from one generation to another, chutney, right? I mean, these are all ways that um, the past has been handed down to, to us. Um, so it is completely legitimate to use those as sources um, and to redefine what the archive is and can be. Yes, we would love to invite Andre to read next. And Andre, I have long been fascinated at how your work addresses and handles notions of truth and identity through multiple genres. Like Nicola spoke a bit about 
your forthcoming essay collection, which I am extremely excited about. But it is, in fact, a poem that you're going to share with us today, and then we'll discuss it. Thanks very much for that, uh, Shivani. And thank you, Gabby and Gaitra, for your wonderful readings. Um, Gaitra, I think, if not novelistic, certainly Kuli Woman is very poetic. And I think your work generally has a poetic sensibility. And I think that's actually evident in your essay in We Mark Your Memory, where you fuse um, poetry from Laura and Kay Lane into it quite seam seamlessly. Um, so The Undiscovered Country is really uh, about a journey of its own from art to politics. And for the purpose of today's talk, um, I was thinking of how it actually tackles East Indian identity and race. And there are many strands within it, within this collection. But um, one of the you know, substantial essays in the book is about politics in Trinidad and Tobago and imagining, reimagining political history um, after uh, the experience of colonialism. And in that, I quite explicitly, you know, I'm, I, I air my views on my, di my dismal <laughs> assessment of the state of race and politics in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, but another important figure in the book is Michel Jean Casabon, who is Trinidad's first international artist. And I think, again, for, if you're talking about uh, the representations of race and black and brown bodies, he's a key figure to keep in mind in a Trinidad and Tobago context um, because of how he could possibly be implicated in a kind of a marginalization of uh, East Indian bodies and black bodies and treating these bodies as set pieces. But I, um, I actually chose to read a poem from Pitch Lake, which Jeremy published, um, because one of the things that I'm drawn to as a, I guess, in my poet cap or hat uh, is that area of a poem that is perhaps beyond translation that is at its edges, at its penumbra, where there's something going on and uh, it's perhaps not explicitly said or signaled, but a, a reader aware and alert to the context might pick up on it. And uh, the poem that I decided to read is called The Haircut. And um, uh, it's a poem which if you you read it, you think it's this poem about a mother-son relationship, about you know, moving from that private space uh, of a domestic setting into the public sphere of the barber shop. But if you keep in mind the fact that hair is such a political uh, thing in itself, and it's actually integral to how we engage with race and self-representation, and hair is a huge part of how we actually receive, um, I think there's a whole other layer to the poem that you could actually invest in it. So I'm going to read The Haircut. The Haircut. I don't remember my first haircut, but I remember who did it. My mother in those days was spry. The clippers singing a complicated melody setting loose frayed edges, making room for growth, like cutting grass, like cutting cane. My head, tenderly in her hands, black hair slipping between fingers. The years. She can't cut my hair now. And to this man in the noisy salon, my head might as well be a coconut. Nothing precious, nothing he hasn't seen. Salt and pepper threads falling to the tired floor. His blade, a cutlass, thrashing. Thank you for that, Andre. You're listening to a poem that is so enmeshed in ideas of intimacy, intimacy between bodies, 
that know each other quite well and bodies that don't makes me think of how that language of either searching for intimacy, trying to preserve it, or trying to acknowledge where it's failed is so present in all of your work. I think in poems and in essays and in your journalistic work, it's, it's so manifestly there. And I'd love to know in the search for which, through which you conduct and construct a poem, do you think it's difficult or it's frightening as a writer to chase that intimacy? Do you set out to do it intentionally or is it a natural product of work that is striving to be the best version of itself? I think um, for a long time, I probably had this Stuart Hall kind of approach to life, which was I, um, I'm, living through, I'm living my life through difference, not despite difference. And, you know, I had this, uh, I guess, naive, naivety of, well, you know, I'm human and I am, I am who I am and, and oh, forget all these labels, you know. And, and then um, you have your lived experience, which, <laughs> which is a whole other story. And um, it's interesting because I am of mixed uh, descent. So my mom is East Indian and my dad is Black. And, you know, that also adds another element to the haircut with the mother and the father figures, anyhow. But, um, uh, and to a large extent, I kind of uh, approach things, I approach everything that I do with this, I guess, no, there's no better way to say it, with this Trinidadian sensibility of, well, there are really no boundaries, there are, everything is within reach. But my own experience has been that having this, um, mixed heritage has at, at once given me access to several different worlds, but at the same time, to some extent also cut me off from them in that, you know, you're never quite accepted as one thing or another, wherever you go, you know? So I myself am the world, but yet there's still also this strange kind of type route that you have to navigate. And perhaps to answer your question then, that lived experience cannot help but be reflected in my own writing in all the different um, forms in, in how I perhaps seek to navigate boundaries uh, of genre even. Um, and I think what is uh, perhaps important for me is just um, acting on my own intuition, um, you know, uh, analyzing and passing experience, but also uh, formulating a response. Um, and that is what the undiscovered country is all about, you know, because I, I worked as a journalist for 10 years and that was a, a memorable experience to say the least. Uh, and, you know, at the end of those 10 years, uh, um, I was adamant that I was going to focus on my creative writing and I was going to uh, finally devote time to the things that I really wanted to do. And I was looking for, well, what would be my next project? And someone said, oh, you wrote all these reviews and all these essays. Why don't you put your essays together into a collection? And I thought, what? such things are done. <laughs> Isn't that cheating? You know, I mean, but I was actually resistant to the idea because I felt as though I've seen it done before where people just replicate their columns or replicate things that they wrote quite mechanically, mechanically, and it's, you know, a bit, I find it sometimes a bit lazy. And I was adamant that if a reader is going to pay money for my book, I'm going to give them a good book. And that's really where you know, the search began. And then finally I had the epiphany, which was I realized I had something to say. And it may sound strange, you know, a journalist writing for 10 years, writing columns, special reports, saying, oh, I, I realized I had something to say, but it's actually, you know, what really um, clicked for me. And then when Jeremy said yes to the book, I realized also that I wasn't completely crazy. <laughs> and, um, 
you know, because one of the big things that I, I, I did for me, the first essay actually that I wrote in the book was The Free Colony, which is all about things that that entire, um, it's a piece of social theory or political theory, whatever you want to call it. But it was all about all of the things that I had been observing over the 10 years as a journalist. But I, I was like, I was seeing all these connections and I was like, well, uh, is this not clear? Are, are people not seeing these, these problems with, for instance, the constitution and the interaction between racism and, 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 and the lingering presence of, of, of capitalist forces that are doing things to us. And, um, and yeah, so that, that is really, I guess, how it happens. It, it flows uh, from the personal into this political realm that cannot help but become an aesthetic kind of expression. Thank you so much for that, Andre. Um, so, Jeremy, um, People Tree Press, I mean, just, just by the name of it, um, it's, it's in its DNA, it, it's connected to, uh, it's rooted in your engagement in your, your previous life before you were a publisher and when you were a scholar, your engagement with Indo-Caribbean writing. So perhaps you could just start by telling us a bit about what was the origins of, tell us about the origins of People Tree Press, because I, I know it, it, it started literally with you going to Guyana as part of your uh, research as an academic and discovering that there were certain kinds of texts, certain kinds of writing and writers that were not able to be published and you felt you had to do something about it. So tell us a bit about how that all started. Okay. Um... I think you, I mean, it wasn't simply just that there were Indo-Caribbean writers who weren't being published at that stage. I think in general, pub, you know, the, sort of the publishing who'd been publishing Caribbean writing had kind of lost interest for a time. But I think there was also the fact that there were a significant number of Indian Caribbean writers who had plenty of things to say. And clearly in terms of the Guyana of that time, people who felt under intense pressure culturally, politically, um, in all sorts of kind of ways. So that, you know, there were, there were a lot of people who, who had things to say. I mean, for me, the kind of, I suppose, the, the kind of the relationship that kind of began people tree was with a Guyanese writer called Rupal Monar, who had broadcast some stories he hadn't published or anything like that. And it was just at the time where, where Guyana was under so much kind of economic pressure that you couldn't find paper in Guyana anywhere. Um, I mean, the government was keeping, keeping, you know, preventing people like the WPA from printing. So they, they were making damn sure that the paper didn't get into the country. So, I, I mean, I, I'd been staying with Monar and things and, and, you know, he was one of my kind of roots into the country. Um, so I, I took his, I liked his stories um, and took them back, back, back to Leeds and did a kind of do-it-yourself job on it. Um, but I mean, I'd been, I'd been in very, very kind of, I mean, I'd been working on a thesis on the presence of Indian, the Indians in the Caribbean since the fairly early 70s. So, you know, I was very much aware of, of where at that point in time, just what, just, just where that Indian presence was. I mean, there was one thing, I'm just remembering one thing, that when I was, in, I was in Trinidad in 1976, and 76 was the very first time when Indian films were actually shown on, on Trinidadian television. And I can remember sort of being in the house of it, I think it was a very sort of liberal-minded, Creole person, and he was horrified to have these Indian films being shown. And I <laughs> he was thinking, you know, okay, that was that was a bit about about the kind of ways in which, and I think so much has changed in that kind of you know, what, almost 40, 50 years since then. So that um, you know that it, it, it's been a kind of really kind of fascinating thing to ob observe that. So I mean, I mentioned Mona as being one of the people who was early published. There were people, you know, so he was important for writing about an area of Indian Caribbean life, which hadn't, hadn't reached writing at all before. I mean, his, the people he writes about are the kind of distant characters. 
in something like A House for Mr. Bizzles. They're, they're seen on the edge of the field. That he writes about them and things. And, and you know, just connecting to that, that theme about, about memory. These were the, 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 that first book of his is set in, it's probably set about the 1930s, when there is, there is only estate life. There is nothing but estate life. And, you know, the, these are stories that, I mean, they're purely, they're totally fictional ones and shaped stories, but they come from people telling him things. And one of the things I, I, I mean, I really remember about being in Guyana at that time was people coming, you know, later on, you know, after the book was published, coming to tell me that was my story too. You know, so that the, there was a kind of, you know, that he, he tapped into a kind of a, a memory that belonged to lots more people. And that was, that was one thing. The other, the other kind of, perhaps was mentioned a couple of other people. I mean, Mahade Das, uh, Guyanese poet, was incred- an incredibly important kind of figure. And I, and I suspect that there are, there are quite a number of writers, one of whom I think possibly I can see sitting, sitting here, who, who would recognise that in Mahade there was, there was a gateway for other, other, particularly other women writers in being able to write in a deeply personal way. And, and you know, and, and I, you kind of recognise that at that kind of point, this was quite, this is, this is sort of mid-70s, this is really quite radical, and, you know, for and, and, and sort of risk-taking for a woman at that kind of point in time. The other person who, who I, again, published fairly early was Lakshmi Pasord. One, th- one of the things I kind of really kind of saw as being important about her work was, I remember, I sort of remember sort of thinking, if you read, if you read V.S. Naipaul, if you read Shiva Naipaul, if you, know, you, you kind of think, believe that Hinduism would be long dead in the Caribbean. But of course, it, it, it hasn't been, and, 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 you know, it probably never will be. But he, the, what, what Lakshmi Prasad's novels did, not only was kind of like, they were, you know, she, she was making come alive the women's voices that are kind of swamped in, in, in most of Naipaul's work, but she was also seeing how the, there was a kind of a daily Hinduism that was very much alive, not dead like Naipaul saw it, and, and that was part of, part of the kind of um, the, way, the way people li- li- led their lives and so on. But it wasn't an exclusive one. It, you know, her story, you know, her, 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 her kind of books are about a village where, you know, which is, which is as much Creole as it is Indian, where, you know, where Indian families celebrate Christmas and, you know, but, but are still intensely Indian Hindu families. And I think, you know, that was one of one of the things that she brought to uh, writing of, about that, that kind of identity. I'd like to ask you, Jeremy, because I think, you know, via People Tree, you've, you've certainly published and you've probably edited more Caribbean writers than anyone else alive. Um, so you've had, you know, and, and editing someone's work, there's a, a particular kind of deep engagement that has to happen. Um, so in, in some ways, you probably know as much as anyone living about uh, Caribbean writing of the past 30, nearly 40 years. But I'm curious to know what you think. You've mentioned three writers who were early people tree authors. Um, how do you think, to bring us back to the, the topic of the panel, how do you think contemporary writing by Indo-Caribbean writers has changed over the past 30 or 40 years? What's different now about the current generation of writers who are writing about some of these issues, these particular stories, or about these particular historical or social topics that's different to how it was being done by that first generation of people tree authors? Mm, that's a difficult one because I, I mean, I think, it, I mean, it's in some respects, I think the, the thing that I would observe it is that I think is the free, the freedom of people of Indian, Indo-Caribbean backgrounds and, and kind of identities to write about anything. Uh, in other words, I think there was, there was a kind of point in the sort of eighties, nineties and so on, where I think there was a certain kind of political pressure to feel that it was important to say something about your place in the Caribbean and fight for your place in the Caribbean. Um, I think that, I mean, I think that pressure is perhaps less, less though. I mean, particularly in perhaps in Trinidad, where there'd be Indian governments and so on and so on. Um, so I think, I mean, it, 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 it's about, 
writers looking in, inward, writers looking at sexual identities, writers looking at, at kind of things where, where in a sense, you know, sort of ethnic identities aren't that important. So I think, I think what I would observe is um, a much greater sense of, of freedom. Um, I'd also perhaps, I mean, I think, I think that um, I've probably turned down more historical Indian Caribbean novels than anything else. And they, you know, that because very few, I mean, the only person I can think of who's written a really, and I've, I've probably forgotten somebody, a really imaginative Indian Caribbean historical novel is David Aberdeen in something like The Counting House. Um, but I, you know, but I, I've written the other ones that um, get stuck, get stuck in the history. They don't bring the history alive. Um, so, I, you know, I think, I mean, I think the kind, that kind of the way that I trust is through sort of memoir and family memory has been the most kind of powerful way of, of looking at that, at that past. Um, somebody will probably just tell me in a minute, well, some brilliant historical novel <laughs> that's escaped by, by memory. But yeah, but I mean, I, th I think it's, it's about, um, it's been more about, I mean, one, one of the things I wanted to say in this, this one, it, 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 just in terms of thinking about that, the, the 175th anniversary, it, it's, I think, you know, what's kind of absolutely kind of, kind of at core to the experience of Indians in the Caribbean is the impossibility of not changing. When you, when you think, think about, you know, this is, a, you know, we're, this must be at least six generations I mean, it's of it, it, uh, uh, people. I mean, if you go back to people who arrived in Trinidad in 1845 or in Guyana a bit before then, six or seven generations, and every single generation must, in some sense, have, have changed dramatically in terms of, of, of their relationship to the to the past. There's a constant turning over. I remember talking to some like Peggy Mohan, a, a linguist who who's, I think has Trinidad connections, but sort of based in India talking about how Bajpuri, suddenly, I mean, Bajpuri as, as a mother tongue, I mean, she could almost say it died out in the 1st of December, 1944 or something. But so, so suddenly from a point where, you know, sort of every, everybody was speaking primarily sort of Bajpuri with a bit of Creole. So, I mean, you know, within sort of 20 years that time, Bajpuri had become a kind of hit, only something that the very old, older people still knew. Or, or that people kind of looked at, you know, sort of tried to revive. So those, those kinds of changes, are, you know, I think are kind of been built into the, the Indo-Caribbean experience and make it a, a constant, you know, give it a constant dynamic. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's different, I mean, it, particularly in, in a sense, different from the African Caribbean experience where, I mean, for I think for Indians, there was never quite that kind of, hiatus that you know that people i mean people have much more sense of, of perhaps of where they came from um there was a big change in the there was a change in the way that uh, the empire regarded it, its captive people so that you know the point where there was a kind of conscious attempt to destroy african culture as being dangerous the, the kind of attitude in the kind of later 19th century was it, it was better to rule people through their own cultures so I think, you know, the, the fact that, it, that the Indian Caribbeans were able to, to hold on to, and there wasn't that much that the colonial authorities actually banned. I mean, they banned things like fire walking and stuff like that. But by and large, they let, left Indians alone to develop, the, you know, to, to... So, I mean, it, it, the, the other thing that always fascinates me has been about... I mean, one of the things I think I set out to do when I wrote my thesis was to kind of get over the fact that there was no such thing as a mon monolithic Indian identity. Indians was, <laughs> were as varied as, as, as anything you could, you could think of. And I can remember, I remember, I remember going, one of the papers I wrote a long, 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 long time ago, I called it Phoebus, Soraya and the Blasted Sun. And it was about that kind of ways in which it, there was a move that you know the literature moved from being very Indo-Saxon, went through went through a, a, a phase of kind of looking back to India, 
and then you know and then of look at looking at, at a kind of a much more native kind of you know Trinidad Indian Guyanese identity um that the kind of i mean the, the, the kind of thing that people t- talked about in Ghana at that stage as being the coolie art forms as being something that had grown specifically out of the, the experience of the sugar estate and so on and I found all those, that kind of stuff really 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 fascinating uh, I would just before we launch into the second phase of discussion, which will involve everyone, I would like to mention that this panel is also being supported by the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts. So we're grateful for that support. And listening to everyone in both readings and perspectives that span generations has been fascinating. It writing about my own Indianness and my complexities entangled in it has been so consuming for me as a creative person for the past several years. I often forget that as much as I think I know about the fact that there can be no monolithic Indian experience, I learn more and more that sometimes blindsides me, often in uncomfortable ways. And I think my question for everyone arising from this is how do the complications of the Indo-Caribbean experience, whether it's your experience personally or an experience you have reflected on through your scholarship, your art, your, your publishing tenure, how have, how have the, those complications influenced the way in which you remember these experiences? Do they enhance the sense that there is a need to pursue many strands of truth to get to that memory or does it take you further away from the idea that there is one ultimate series of narratives that needs upholding over another uh, if i could just say that, that i mean my experience as an observer of things has been that the that you can't have other than a multiplicity of narratives you know, in other words, there, are, there are, you know, there is no one true story. That you know, that from time to time, it strikes me that you know, sometimes people want to insist on a particular kind of, of, of story. I mean, one of, I mean, one of the people who I really rate as a kind of writer about the Indo-Caribbean experience is the historian Clem Cichran. And one of the, you know, one of the things that you know Clem has done. It, it, it has taken on the attempt sometimes to kind of either you know to to, to see the experience as one as a victimhood, um, and I think you know that what what Clem does he, you know he recognizes there were there were probably hundreds of thousands of people who suffered along the way, but that for many of the Indians who came, that coming to the Caribbean was an opportunity. A real opportunity, and that you know, although the kind of narratives were about people being stolen away and so on, you know, obviously people, you know, discovered that it wasn't, you know, that the opportunities were not what they were cracked up to be, but that never, nevertheless, that, that that many people found spaces in the Caribbean to become more to become more themselves. You know, and I think it's important that, that you, you know, that you hear both the writers, like somebody like Sonny Ledu, who recognises there were people who were victims, who were unable to escape from, from the kind of the, the place they were in, but also that recognising that there were people who right from the start were, were making new lives for themselves. I mean, what, one of the things I, I kind of I picked up, I just I don't know if you can see it, was... This book here I've had on my shelves for ages, and it's the Indian Centenary Review of Trinidad, 1845 to 1945, 75 year old, old book. And it's a fascinating kind of thing about how at that period, you know, Indians were, were seeing themselves. And, but you, you could think, you know, that, that a book written 30 years later would have been very different. So, the, the, you know, I, I have to think that the, the narratives have to be multiple and multiple multiplicities um you know there isn't any one kind of one one kind of truth at all yeah and i think that one of the exciting things about the moment that we're in really is that 
there is so many talented people at work and um, younger people coming up that uh, it sort of reduces any burdens of representation that any single one of us might feel. So I can, um, you know, feel free to tell my story that is my story because I know, for instance, like just to throw one name out there, Aliyah Khan, who is an English professor at the University of Michigan and also a creative writer, enormously talented. Um, her scholarship on Islam in the Caribbean, her book, Far From Mecca, has just come out from Rutgers University Press um, and tells a very complicated story about Islam in the Caribbean. Um, so I know that she's out there doing that work um, and other younger writers, whether they're located within the Caribbean or in the diaspora, um, they're telling their own stories. Um, but you'll bear with me if I sort of think out loud on your question about negotiating the complexities of Indo-Caribbean identity. Um, and again, you know, I'd have to add another hyphen there in my case, a very important hyphen, right? Because I'm Indo-Caribbean American. Um, and so, I mean, existing in America in the 1980s when we arrived there <laughs> and in this very, you know, fraught, traumatic moment um, over race, around race. You know, I have always been in a brown body in a majority white country, right? Um, and the city that I grew up in is enormously diverse, but this was always about finding solidarity with other black and brown bodies, right? So you take that sensibility and then you for force it <laughs> or, or thrust it into contention with a Guyanese political and racial complexity, right? And that, that history, which as we all know is so um, bitterly divided between Indians and Africans, right? So I have to see my own particular identity as an Indo-Caribbean American, um, which can feel so burdened, right? I have to see that as an opportunity for me going into a Guyanese space. And the book project that I'm very slowly working on now is about race in Guyana and about America, also very much about America in the world, right? I have to see my Indo-Caribbean identity as creating, uh, you know, like, humanistic possibilities when I step into that fraught Guyanese political space and try to tell that divided history. And, you know, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. I just wanted to, to say also as well, going back to that, that issue of uh, not having a monolithic identity. Um, it's not only, not only is it that the narrative is not monolithic, but identity itself is, is, is really fluid and permeable and everybody goes through this kind of voyage. And I have this story of when, so I used to be a law student in London. It was my first time away from Trinidad. It was like a whole new world. And I was really missing going to the beach, going to the sea. Like, I was like, oh, my God. So I found, like, there was a public swimming pool. It was in this gym sporting complex. It was brand new. It was, like, you know, it's where all these buff people were going to exercise. But I was just going there to do a few laps in the pool as my kind of feeble recreation of the ocean. And one day I was swimming. I was actually literally taking laps in the pool. And this man stopped me and he said, excuse me are you a coolie? <laughs> I, I kid you not, this happened. And I was just like, I was like, okay, there was so many levels of confusion going on in my mind because I was like, is this person using the word coolie in that sophisticated sense that is used by, by coolie woman and by David Davidi and coolie Odyssey and even Pat Mohammed's coolie pink and green thing? Um, is this, is he, is that where he's coming from or is he using it in a pejorative sense or is this a pickup line? What, you know, I was like, this is bizarre. And I, so I was so 
confused, you know, I just, I just continued swimming because I was just like, I can't deal with this, you know, and, and what if it was meant in a bad way, then I would be, you know, in, inter, interacting with a person in a way that I would condone what he had just said. Um, but that experience in the middle of this spanking new, this is in London, this is in um, Vauxhall, you know, spanking new world. This was Tony Blair's London. You know, this was like a different country. And this word is thrown at me and it has, is obviously quite loaded and it's very old. And, and I just thought, oh, this is amazing how I was going about my life as a Trin- Trinidadian, you know, just coming here, doing my studies. And then, bam! someone throws this word at me and that's the type of messy kind of experience we all go through because before that I perhaps would not have even contemplated you know how different people could regard this word in different ways um and I guess you know Shivani going back to what you're asking uh I guess then that informs your sensibility in terms of your work um I have for instance I've engage with the work of some East Indian artists like Wendy Nanan and Andal Gosain and some of my poetry. Um, but it probably is, I guess, writing becomes this whole way of analyzing experience and using it as therapy. Um, <laughs> uh, but ultimately to get to a truth or, or escape the truth or, or even maybe interrogate the truth in a way that brings you to some sort of new understanding. Gabrielle, I really want to hear what you have to say about this question of these competing multiple identities. And then there's something else I want to ask you, but, but tell us, talk about that first, please. So I always think of myself as not your expected Indian. Um, and, <laughs> and um, you know, when I came back to Trinidad after university, I did my MPhil at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies in 1997. And my thesis was on young Indian womanhood because I didn't know how to be a young Indian woman. So I went about trying to research it by interviewing 90 something girls and doing a thesis on it. And then I, you know, didn't ethnographic experience of being Miss Mastana Bahar, which was um, another story, um, not for here, but was tremendously educational because I realized how much as I can't speak for Indian men, but for Indian women, we are constantly trying on symbolic outfits of who we are supposed to represent ourselves and who we're supposed to be. And so these girls who were in the Miss Mastana Bahar pageant with me would be doing, you know, they look, they have the whole beauty queen look, but then you see them in coconuts, you know, partying like on Saturday, being totally you know, not the Indian girls that they were representing themselves as. And coming to understand that Indian women have constantly been, and girls in particular, as they grow, are playing that, for me, was really freeing. And um, and since then, I haven't tried to be any kind of Indian woman, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and if I had, I might have failed. Um, so, you know, often I see myself... Uh, um, it's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm playing multiple roles all at the same time and some of them are masked by the others so I can be in a shalwar but I'm going to be you know doing rapso on the stage with with rapso people which is a very Afrocentric space but I'm wearing a sari you know I'm in a space speaking as an um, or writing as an Indian woman in the newspaper, but I guarantee to you I've used the word lesbian the most times in the Trinidad and Tobago press as any single person in history. And that is very deliberate on my part to write women in. You know, I, um, I Juve, for example, I decided I would play Kali, right? <laughs> and that didn't go down well with a certain pandita who wanted me to send her a photo of what I look like so she could approve and, you know, that a certain type of person who believes in Kali could invoke Kali and so on. But I was like, Juve is actually a place in which you can, um, is, is, a, is a place of reverence, has its own sacred um, possibilities of becoming and why not invoke meaningful 
um, Indian mythologies in that space and then play them in the ways that so often are seen as corrupted, but which is how we make things our own. Um, and so that was really great. And um, my girlfriend made me a trident. So I really love the fact that I have a Muslim background, was carrying a trident that my girlfriend made, I had a Kali mask and so on, and was in Juve and nobody would like any of it. <laughs> except for me. <laughs> and so for me, I, um, I have quite enjoyed my, my own experience of becoming over the past 20 years has been about not having to meet anybody's expectations and about playing multiple expectations um, off in order to disturb them in a sense. So my column tomorrow in the Newsday, and Shivani um, has been, wrote about this just today, is about what, what does it mean to be an Indo-Caribbean person and be committed to seeing the struggle against anti-blackness above and beyond the racial politics of the Caribbean as something much bigger as something much more foundational. How do we get beyond ourselves and, you know, the racial politics of Ghana, the racial politics of Trinidad, the feelings of exclusion? You know, the prime minister in this bizarre gesture, 60 years to the day, used the same recalcitrant minority phrase, April 1st, 1958, April 1st, 2020. It's weird. And so we have, how do we as Indians step out of all of that um, tension and animosity to recognize the coloniality that is the long necropolitics of the region and, and to do so in ways that does not mean that we are any less Indian for it. And, um, and so I have quite enjoyed it. And I'll tell you the truth. The truth is that Caribbean feminism has provided that space for me. And often when we think about Caribbean feminism, we think it is Afro-Caribbean. But what for me I was naming on Indian Arrival Day was the number of the fast number of Indian women that I know, um, um, including Gayatra, including Shivani, and so many others that for me constitute into um, the constitute Caribbean feminism, which is a space where those kinds of naughty identity politics questions can actually be experimented with in um, an irreverent, if necessary, but in a pleasurable and certainly in, um, in a way that is about defining our own politics for ourselves as Indian women and insisting on that in doing so. At the same time, just to end, you know, I have really been guided by Joy Mahabir's writing, Angel Gosain writing, Nalini Mohabir, and many others about archives off the page. And so, for example, I wear my grandmother's wedding ring, which is over 100 years old. I wear my, um, my parent, my mother's wedding ring. I carry bracelets as a symbol of Indian women's labor, liberation, and... Um, and labor resistance to quote Joy Mahabir. And so I like to carry and walk and live with these symbols, but at the same time define what they mean for uh, myself and to do so without any fear of anybody else's heteropatriarchal or whatever expectations that I must meet. And it's been good. <laughs> It's important to resist cultural policemen of all kinds, isn't it? <laughs> well, you, you kind of answered the question I wanted to ask you, Gabriel, talking about that, you know, family archive in the form of objects that you keep close to you. Because um, when I was introducing you at the beginning, I uh, didn't say explicitly that in addition to everything else, you've just mentioned it, you write a newspaper column. Um, and I always think that, you know, the the writers in Trinidad and Tobago who have the biggest audience and potentially the biggest impact in the general public are precisely our you know, newspaper columnists because they're writing in newspapers every week. Um, and it's fascinating to me that your column, which is called you know, Di Diary of a Mothering Worker, not a working mother, but a mothering worker. I wanted to ask you a bit about how 
that family, kind of family memory, family traditions, family stories, a sense of coming from a lineage, how that informs your work. But you've just answered that. But maybe tell, could you tell us a bit about if and how that's also maybe infiltrated, that sense of, of family has infiltrated your academic research? You talked about the kind of, um, you know, the anthropological immersion in, you know, in Mastana Baha and so on. But has, has your sense of, of family lineage also shaped your, your academic research? Yes. And, you know, it's important that I also speak uh, as someone who comes from a Muslim family as well in this. And that's also important. Um, very Muslim family. And, you know, and so I write about my great great grandmother, who was a very pious woman. Um, and, but yet, uh, um, you know, not, but was going to school in the late 1800s, you know, could read um, in several languages. And I was inspired very much by A Silent Life by Ryan Shaw, where she writes about Indian women in the 1930s being literate, reading Marxist literature, and the way that that idea that Indian women were not just on plantations in the, in the 1980s, 1930s, 1920s period, but could in fact have been reading newspapers and were very cognizant of what was happening in the world wars. And I think about my grandmother who insisted on. Um, on calling a daughter a name she had decided and not the one the husband recorded in the press. But on the question of family, just to conclude this and to connect to Andre, I have, I think my own trajectory has been really developed by my Dobla daughter and the fact that she is not phenotypically um, what we, what is accepted as Indian. And so my work in the, the book, Indo-Caribbean Feminist Thought, has been about, on the one hand, um, has been about opening the boundaries of what's Indian and allowing her, as someone who doesn't look Indian, but who has as much Indian ancestry as any of us in the Indian community, to claim being Indian, not part Indian, not some Indian, but to claim Indianness in all of its um, imperfect, impure, mixed form as we live it culturally and indeed biologically in the region. And so through who I have, um, I've thought about the ways that, um, you know, I think about her as Indian, um, I, and I think about her as African, and I think about her as mixed, but I wanted to be able to, to claim all. Um, and, and Andre, as you were saying, you know, to be sort of allowed fully into none, but to claim all without having to be allowed um, to be claimed back by the, those who, who put the boundaries on what that means. And so to find new communities, political communities, creative communities, artistic communities, sexual and gender, you know, movements and so on, where she could be Indian in the ways that she is and in the ways that she chooses. And so for me, I've been really inspired to rethink my own privilege, my privileged phenotypical Indianness, and to, to open the boundaries of that uh, um, in the ways that I can because of it. I mean, we, we're talking a lot about memory as tied to the act of reclamation, whether it's reclaiming the word and the state of being a Kuli, as, as Kuli woman does, as we make navigations with those reclamations in ways that happen on the page that we all do to some extent, and also Andre's story of the pool encounter, can show that those reclamations can be different, not necessarily harder or easier, but different in life off of the page. So my question for everyone is, how does your memorying look in a very scholarly space, in a space of reading, writing and ideas? Is there a dissonance between that space and the space of going to the market, picking mangoes from trees, liming with your friends? Do you find there's a natural flu intersection in those two worlds or do they feel very separate? I guess um, they feel uh, it's, it is uh, an interesting uh, antinomy there because they feel very separate in the sense that I sometimes get the sense that the person on the page 
uh, is completely different <laughs> from the person in real life. And that could be because I'm schizophrenic. Or <laughs> it could just be that natural type of um, relationship that happens through, I guess you go through your lived experiences and sometimes you get ideas and you think, oh, you know, this would be interesting to explore in a poem, in an essay, and whatever. Or sometimes you just go through your experience and you get this feeling and this sense of, hmm, there's a, an emotion or something quite, uh, you're not quite clear what it is, but it's just nagging you and you just need to somehow deal with it. And the forum to deal with it is the page. Um, there's this uh, British novelist, uh, Rachel Cusk, and you know she also writes essays. And she she once said, the essay is the blankest of blank pages. And I I just think that's that's really true, and that's really how I uh, approach things for the undiscovered country. In that I felt the essay as a, a, a form was so malleable to so many different modes of 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 being, so many different political positions in terms of how we approach the page. Is it a poem? Is it this uh, manifesto? Is it a, a piece of visual art? And I guess that is how it, it, it finds expression for me. Perhaps just, just to say something about as being kind of, um, that I discovered long after I'd begun writing the thesis, that there was potentially some family connections to the whole business of intention. I knew, I knew my grandfather had been a civil servant in India. I didn't really know him. He, was, he, he married very late. He was an old man when I was a very small child. Um, but I, after my parents died, I found, I found things that he'd left behind that made a kind of interesting connection that I discovered that he, you know, he, he'd actually been a magistrate. He was probably in India for about 10, 10 years. The horrific thing I discovered was that India doesn't seem to have passed through his brain in the slightest. So I found, there were two, I found two books of his where he'd, I mean, I'll show you one of them. It's called Inspector Book, The District Judge, and it was Chindwara, which is, I think it was in the central provinces then and is now Madhya Pradesh now. And it was kind of like on the edge of the territories from which Indian indentured laborers came. Now, whether he actually ever signed anybody's papers, I don't know. I mean, it was yeah, I mean, he, he long gone before I ever began to discover any of these things. But I, and I found a photograph of him with, on a horse with a pith helmet in India. And the, the, you know, there, there is a kind of space and mystery there. Because he never, both of them are two books. They're, they've got labels on the front. And there's nothing inside. He wrote nothing about India at all. And I just, you know, this is, I found that very, very kind of strange. And, that, I mean, when I, I kind of, when, when we kind of found things that they come back, all I found from, that he brought back from India were French novels. So it, it, there is a peculiar kind of colonial kind of experience that, um, you know, I, I kind of struggle to make, make, make sense of and, and may, you know, make no kind of real personal connection. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I found that kind of absence of curiosity kind of really, really weird. Well, <clears throat> I'll answer briefly just by way of uh, quoting my father who's taken to saying after telling me most stories or really anything, that's off the record, right? <laughs> because they're so used to my pillaging everything that happens <laughs> in our histories and our lives for it, It's just uh, what I do <laughs> these days. Um, but I, I, I actually wanted to read, a, if there's time, a Mahadai Das poem on the theme of not arrival, but departing. 
if you will indulge me, yeah. So um, this is from her collection Bones, published by People Tree. Uh, so departing. Departing is simple. Cram suitcases, a ticket, a change of address. The future doesn't need a destination. I have that in your eyes. In your heart, I have not found a port, but wide open seas where I may dream. In your arms, I find not a denial, but wonderful affirmations. Your smile possesses power to ignite candles in my heart. And in your hands, you hold my candelabra of dreams. Arriving will never be unless God has set a date to judge me by. I'm sure he's too busy for, for that. So between never arriving and always leaving, my spirit swings like a pendulum in the clock of the universe. And were it to unhinge, I would be a bird flying backwards forever. So I have to admit I was feeling a bit of arrival exhaustion this year that I didn't actually want to hear <laughs> at all about marking any of these anniversaries because um, I feel like her constantly unhoused in my own skin that I, I mean, yes there was a rival in, in Guyana in the Caribbean and then there was a rival in the US and then you know uh, our the demo demagogues who run the world make you feel further unhoused in your own skin and there is just a sense of constant motion and that's the spirit I guess I want to um, invoke <laughs> right now. Um, I suppose I'd answer, in a, I'd answer that question in a slightly different way, which is to, um, in fact, say, what does it mean to be here today, 175 years later, in the bodies that we are in, in the region that we in, are in? And uh, I feel like the 175th anniversary there's so much debate around it. There's people who have a problem with it being celebrated, people who think it should be a memorialization of the violence and the exploitation. You know, Trinidadians do this weird happy Indian arrival day thing. But ask Trinidadians, right? I mean, the happy Eid, you know, and so on. And, um, and so um, I think I just want to value this moment the 175th anniversary for me feels like a moment that we, um, as Jeremy said, can continue to make ourselves. I don't know that we need to be looking for cohesion because I'm not sure what we would be cohering to because so much of what we've inherited is uh, um, so structured to dehumanize and to contain and to um, efface and to silence. And instead, I think in the process of making ourselves and having made lots of different types of journeys to the point of being able to make ourselves in the ways we are able to today. How does that allow us as Indians in the Caribbean to be part of um, a people that is figuring out what it means to be self-determining and to almost work that out as if uh, um, we have the opportunity to um, we have the opportunity to become on our own terms. They will not be the terms that others necessarily approve, not from the past, not with other worldviews, not necessarily from other races or even from our own, whatever race means, and so on. But I am emboldened by a younger generation that I find to be so irreverent and yet so invested, so self-determining and yet so historical, um, so valuing of history at the same time. And for me, it's the back and forth between that 
that I think, when I think of 175th anniversary, I think of how important it is for us to note that. It is important. We are survivors of many crossings, among survivors of many crossings. What we have out of that legacy is an ability to take it all and carry it in our Jahajin bundles into the direction that we decide. And, and doing that for me is really where, our, um, where we are compelled to, to make decisions that are important, not just for us, but for the region that we're now in. The idea of becoming on our own terms is the perfect place to not to necessarily to end this conversation, but certainly to pause it. I mean, this feels like the things we've been talking about feel like this is a conversation that will continue, you know, between, among us, among other people for, for generations to come. But um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for spending this time having this conversation with us. And um, I'll say one more time, thank you to the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts of Trinidad and Tobago for supporting the NGC Boca Slip Fest and events like this. Shivani? To add to that, uh, my own gratitude and the fact that there have been so many extraordinary books and resources mentioned in this discussion. What we will try to do is to leave a list of them in the comment section when you view this premiere video. Uh, I encourage you to spend time with all of them. You can start with, if you haven't yet, We Mark Your Memory the most recent of our PCASH Press publications. And Nicholas is holding it up there. It has pieces by Gabrielle Gayatra and many other tremendous writers. And thank you all. Thanks so much to our panel and to everyone viewing. And we hope that this act of memorying and remembering only continues to be more and more radical and transgressive and healing. So thank you.